Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? The Red River Institute of History, johnjdwyer.com, me, Gwen Falconer Lippert, and our signature sponsor, Atwood's Stores, present Oklahoma Gold. Together with our Will Rogers medallion-winning author-historian, John J. Dwyer, we'll stitch the golden threads of Oklahoma history. It's Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history when the stories are about Oklahoma. John J. Dwyer, what is the most important day in Oklahoma history? Well, Gwen, uh, nothing like an easy question, right? But years ago, longtime Oklahoma Historical Society Executive Director Bob Blackburn, the Dean of 21st Century Oklahoma Historians, published his list of the 50 most important dates in Oklahoma history. I was startled to see what event sat atop that list. It was one that occurred well more than two centuries ago, and more than one century even before Oklahoma statehood. It was Thomas Jefferson's historic Louisiana Purchase. So why did the legendary Dr. Bob rate that remote event, obscure to most Oklahomans, as the most important event in state history? Why did he? Well, glad you asked. He cited how the act annexed into the United States all the land of present-day Oklahoma, with the possible exception of the Panhandle, and that Jefferson intended a portion of the land, this is in 1803, to provide a colonization or settlement area for America's native tribes. That's right, Thomas Jefferson, who nearly 30 years before, as a young man, had authored nothing less than the Declaration of Independence, and who was now serving the first of his two consecutive terms as President of the United States of America, had, first among the leadership of our very young country, foreseen both the need to establish a large, secure reserve for the continent's indigenous peoples, but also to do so where our own modern-day state of Oklahoma lies. For the Louisiana Purchase occurred in 1803, nearly three decades before Indian Territory's existence and location gained common recognition. Indeed, Thomas Jefferson possessed one of the great minds in American history and one of its most audacious spirits. And now we begin to see how closely the past and the present of our beloved Oklahoma are tied to that mind and spirit. So just what brought about these big doings among some of the world's greatest nations, over vast stretches of dangerous, mostly barren land in the remote middle of the North American continent. Well, the brutal mercantilist wars of England, France, Spain, and others reached epidemic proportions of tragedy with the rise of Napoleon, and so did their threat to United States hegemony in North America. Mercantilism, by the way, in short, is the pessimistic, anchored-in-fear belief that nations must compete for limited global resources, a pie that can never grow larger, rather than the traditional American free market capitalist belief that not only the pie, but everyone's pie can grow larger if everyone works hard enough and lives well enough. So the brutal French dictator Napoleon offered the vast tract of land known as Louisiana, comprised of all or part of the modern states of Louisiana, Arkansas, Missouri, Iowa, Minnesota, Texas, Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, North Dakota, New Mexico, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, and Oklahoma, a land larger than the existing United States of the time, and a land that that he could not defend or afford to the Americans. And he did so for an incomparably small cost in order to stockpile cash for his coming showdown with the English. When he did, President Jefferson faced one of the supreme dilemmas of his and America's life. Champion of a strict and loyal reading of American constitutionalism, he saw no warrant for purchasing Louisiana, whatever the issues of national security, without a constitutional amendment. So he proposed one and sought counsel from colleagues who esteemed the great document as highly as himself. 
Jefferson eventually feared that the volatile Napoleon would remove his offer before an amendment could pass, which might take years in the partisan Federalist versus Republican Congress. In that case, someone besides America might wind up with the Louisiana Territory and thus provide a powerful enemy all along our western border while forever stopping our opportunity for westward expansion and growth. So, the Virginian cut the deal with the French ruler, stunning the world, especially the British Empire, arch-rival to France, and catapulting the U.S. forward as a national force permanently to be reckoned with and boasting gargantuan new resources and land. Louisiana was America's first imperial possession, wrote historian George Dargo, for a regime based upon the principles of strict construction and limited federal power, this was a remarkable doctrinal turnabout and a perversion of the essential meaning of republicanism. And that's the end of that quote. Well, the Louisiana Purchase did carry Jefferson away from his philosophy of strict constructionist constitutionalism and local rather than national centers of government. Economist and historian Thomas DiLorenzo wrote, however, that the act no more negated the Virginians' consistent beliefs than did free market economist Adam Smith's late service as a tariff collector for the British government undo his historic case for free trade and against mercantilism in his landmark economic work, The Wealth of Nations. Jefferson's own words, meanwhile, reveal his aim with the purchase to protect his young nation from European threats, benefit both whites and natives by separating them with the Mississippi River and consolidate and strengthen American citizenry east of the Mississippi rather than dilute it by allowing it to span the continent. In the end, the Louisiana Purchase proved a double-minded betrayal by Jefferson of one of the great pillars of his personal and private belief system, as well as an audacious, visionary triumph of epical scale an enduring majesty that helped shape a nation, a civilization, and a world. His grand yet tortured vision for Louisiana, which more than doubled the land area of the United States, did not end with its purchase from Napoleon and the French. And by the way, the Louisiana Purchase proved one of the greatest real estate deals in history for America. But Jefferson wanted the colossal area comprising Louisiana territory vastly larger than the eventual state of Louisiana, he also wanted that surveyed and mapped, especially its borders with Spanish-held Texas to the south and west, and he wanted American civilization secured from the Spaniards and any other possible threats. Jefferson advocated accomplishing the latter not through American settlement of the Louisiana Purchase, but by using it as an enormous buffer zone from foreign powers. And we forget, Gwen, that Spain, England, France, even Russia, believe it or not, they all wanted the land that became Oklahoma. With the passage of time, we've come to just assume that our beloved state has always been part of America and never could have been anything else. On the contrary, it could very well have become part of any of several other nations had it not been for the blood, treasure, and sacred honor of many American patriots, and no one more so than Thomas Jefferson. I don't think that was taught in Oklahoma history. The golden nugget when we return. This is Oklahoma Gold. Dignifying our history, talking about the most important day in Oklahoma history. John J. Dwyer, Thomas Jefferson had a vision for the Native Americans? That's right. Uh, within the Louisiana Purchase, vast as it was, one of President Thomas Jefferson's greatest visions through that was something of immense import, especially to us Oklahomans. He envisioned, and again, we're talking 1790s, very early 1800s, setting aside a portion of Louisiana territory, America's vast new expanse, from Napoleon as a preserve for the Indian tribes. He'd come to believe that they should relocate to their own remote lands west of the Mississippi River, not just modern-day Oklahoma, but the whole thing, both for their well-being and that of the growing white American population. 
he launched a series of subsequent expeditions into present-day Oklahoma and the Southwest that later presidents would continue from 1806 to 1820. These efforts sought to and succeeded in charting for the first time the key waterways through present-day Oklahoma, including the Arkansas and Red Rivers. We've talked in other episodes of Oklahoma Gold of men such as Pushmataha, David Folsom, and Elias Boudinot as founding grandfathers, if you will, of Oklahoma. But I believe, Gwen, that a case could be made for Thomas Jefferson as the founding great-grandfather, or perhaps grand patriarch of Oklahoma. Jefferson's July 11, 1803 letter to British-born American Revolutionary War hero General Horatio Gates brims with excitement. This is in his own words what Jefferson himself thought about the Louisiana Purchase, and also with contempt for their and future President James Monroe's common political adversaries of the Federalist Party, which included John Adams, Alexander Hamilton, and others. In these words which follow, Thomas Jefferson speaks to you and me, you listening right now, the people of Oklahoma, across oceans of time and history, about our land, which he himself enabled us to have. Quoting Jefferson now, I accept with pleasure and with pleasure reciprocate your congratulations on the acquisition of Louisiana, for it's a subject of mutual congratulation, as it interests every man of the nation. The territory acquired, as it includes all the waters of the Missouri and Mississippi, has more than doubled the area of the United States, and the new part is not inferior to the old in soil, climate, productions, and important communications. If our legislature dispose of it with the wisdom we have a right to expect, they may make it the means of tempting all our Indians on the east side of the Mississippi to remove to the west and of condensing instead of scattering our population. I find our opposition is very willing to pluck feathers from James Monroe, although not fond of sticking them into Robert Livingston's coat. And just as an aside, Gwen, hardball politics is nothing new in America. <laughs> These guys did not like each other. In, in some cases, they were willing to put each other in prison then, too, if they could. But back to Jefferson's uplifting letter on the Louisiana Purchase. The truth is, both have a just portion of merit, in other words, both sides of the political aisle. And were it necessary or proper, it would be shown that each has rendered peculiar services and of important value. These grumblers, too, though, Thomas Jefferson continued in his letter to Horatio Gates, are very uneasy lest the administration should share some little credit for the acquisition, the whole of which they ascribe to the accident of war. They would be cruelly mortified could they see our files from May 1801, the first organization of our administration, but more especially from April 1802. They would see that though we could not say when war would arise, yet we said with energy what would take place when it should arise. We did not, by our intrigues, produce the war, but we availed ourselves of it when it happened. And that's the end of the quote. And he's referring to the wars between France against Britain, the Russians, and, and other Europeans who were trying to keep stop the Napoleonic steamroller, which was bankrupting Napoleon, forcing him to need cash that he was going to get from selling Louisiana territory to us. Well, in our nugget for today, our golden nugget, Jefferson's conflict with fellow U.S. President John Adams gradually blossomed into a tremendous friendship as the years and their political contests passed. How remarkable that both these giants of American history, the nation's second and third presidents, died within a few hours of one another. And wait till you hear the date on which they died. July 4th, 1826, half a century to the day of the Declaration of Independence by the United States from Great Britain, a document primarily authored by Jefferson. And nearly Jefferson's final words were, is it the fourth yet? Adams died a few hours after his colleague, and his final words were, independence forever, for Thomas Jefferson survives. Now that's Oklahoma Gold.